So first of all, good afternoon, y'all. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, today, I'm going to give you kind of a mini retrospective. And I used to be a professor, so one of the reasons why I want you to come closer is I like to call on folks, like this amazing gentleman in the blue right here, right? So when I think about retrospectives, it's kind of like the greatest hits of an artist. So I'm a hip hop head. This is like Nas Illmatic. It's like the Lost <laughs> Tapes Volume 3. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Thinking about Woo. what does it mean to find your voice? What does it mean to use your experiences, your pain, your insecurities, to create something greater than yourself? Now, this is going to be interactive, so that's why I wanted you guys to come close so that way we can have a conversation. We're going to start with a video, and I have some questions for you as well. So again, this is not my birth and death, right? <laughs> kind of looks like it. We're really going to talk about what it means to find your voice as an artist. And how do you use photography and video to create something greater than yourself? I'm on my way to work. It's always a performance. I perform for them, and I make them perform for me. Today, I'm going to let them touch me. I know they want to. They told me. They told me at work. I'm on my way to work and I'm going to perform for them. I'm going to let them touch me. I know they'll like it. I'm on my way to work. Uh, so it was actually fairly um, uncomfortable. It's not an activity that, you know, I would have any experience with. It's not something that I enjoy uh, doing. I guess I suppose that sort of violent physical contact is not the sort of thing that... Um, <clears throat> uh, it felt extremely voyeuristic and somewhat awkward to be doing this in the cafeteria. Um, Yeah, I, I, th those those were the two primary things. Those were the two primary things. I remember it feeling weird, um, only because I'd never felt her hair before like that. Um, and I remember the scent of her hair, or the hairspray, hair products that she used, um, actually lasting on my hands for, for a while, probably the rest of the afternoon. Yeah, it was definitely odd. It was crazy. It was uh, it was memorable. Um, gosh, I don't know what to say. Um, never quite had an experience quite like that. Just felt like God, I don't know. Stop it. Felt like I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing, but wanted to do. So it was um, definitely uh, an interesting experience. I had never uh, been uh, involved with anything like this and uh, had, a, had a good time and um, a lot of fun. Uh, it was definitely the first time. Uh, it was soft, uh, you know, a little strange, weird at first. Um, uh, I guess like the first time for anything. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I never, never did it. Never, never did that before. So, uh, but made my hands feel like you know shiny afterwards. Um, so, like I said, a little awkward in the beginning, but pretty much it. Okay. So, does anybody know what happened? What happened? They did what? They touched my hair. Are you sure about that? 
You think so? Something, something along those lines. Uh, as you can tell, I'm pretty tall, right? I'm like 5'11". With my afro, like if the sprinklers went off, I would literally have the largest afro you've ever seen in your life. Angela Davis would be jealous of this afro if she saw this thing. And so I used to work in IT in an office with mostly white men. You could see me kind of floating over the cubicles in the office space. And one day, my white female colleague came to me. She was my supervisor. And she said, you know, India, I was talking to Paul the other day, and he loves your hair. I was like, oh. You know, he really wants to know what it feels like. Now, mind you, Paul didn't even know my name, right? Let alone know that he was talking about me, wanting to touch me at work. As a woman of color, I was uncomfortable. I was the elephant in the room that everyone was talking about, but no one was talking to. Their stares were unwavering. I wasn't surprised by the rumors. However, as an artist, I was intrigued. I said, well, how can I become a part of this conversation? How can I join this dialogue? And so I set up two cameras in the middle of the office, and I asked each man to participate in an art project. I said, I want you to touch my hair. Surprisingly, no one said no, right? Like all 17 wanted to participate, and we weren't in some back room. We were literally in the middle of the office, and they took turns. And so they touched it, and I said, I want you to touch a little harder. And they touched it a little harder, and I said, you can pull it harder than that, can't you? And they pulled it a little harder. And then I came back a week later, and I interviewed them. And I said, well, how was it? How did you like it? And you can hear in their voices that these men are uncomfortable. I think one man said his hands felt shiny. Like, how do your hands feel shiny, right? Or one guy said that the scent was on his hands all day long. My mama was like, what is on your hair that made that man not want to wash his hands all day long? But for me, in making this work, the idea was make the comfortable uncomfortable. You see, as a black woman in that space, I was uncomfortable every day, every day. But what happens when I give you something you want, something you desire? You have an experience, and then you have to talk about it to the person you had the experience with. Well, it was visible, they were uncomfortable, and um, that was the goal. All right, so we're gonna keep going. Now, like I said, I'm tall, and most of the guys looked at me like this, right? Like, this was kind of the, my vantage point in the office. This is how the guys looked at me, right? But we made work together like this. Now, I'm a strong believer that if you make something together, it can bring you together in ways that you never imagined. Now, my white female colleagues were more forthcoming with their comments, as women can be, and they would say things like, girl, how'd your hair get like that? Or can my hair do that? Or can I touch it? And I said, you know what? I can give you this look. I can do that for you. And they were like, really? I said, yes, girl, I can do this. However, I want you to take a corporate portrait afterwards. And they said, well, why am I taking a corporate portrait? I said, because we're going to question conformity. What does it mean to fit into a space as a black woman that was never designed for you in the first place? And so I gave each woman a hairstyle that I've had over the course of my professional career, and I had them take a portrait afterwards. And here's Ellen. Some people say she'll say Benjamin Franklin. I don't think so. I think it's like a Benjamin Franklin-esque kind of portrait, right? And so each woman was required to get their hair done. They had to wear a suit a white shirt, and come take a portrait. Here's Christine and Desiree. Now, when I did this work, I was 28 years old, and I assumed that these white women had no idea what I was talking about. The idea of having to fit into a space that was never designed for you in the first place. I was wrong. Not only did the women understand, but they had their own stories their own testimonies. For instance, Desiree is actually of mixed race. Her father is black, her mother is white. And she told me when she started working in the corporate space, they asked her to change her name. They said that Desiree was too exotic and that Anne would be more fitting for her in order to gain more opportunities. Here's Beth 
and Charlotte. Charlotte was an executive actually in New York, and she had her own company, and she told me, she said, you know, India, one of my board members came to me and said, you know, Charlotte, you're great, but if you would send someone younger to represent your business, you get more clients. Now, many people ask me, did the women like the hairstyles? No. Hell no. They did not like these hairstyles. You can imagine, if I give you a hairstyle, you have no time to process, and then I make you take a picture afterwards, that is a lot to take in. Now, the stylist gave Charlotte cornrows, and after the photo shoot, I was like, you know, Charlotte, we can take these out before you leave. And she said, no, India, we're going to leave them in because my husband is blind, and he's not going to know who he's with tonight. And I was like, all right, cool. That we will leave those in, no problem. His Christine, she literally needed three glasses of wine to take this picture. I thought her hair looked all right, but for her it was a lot. And here's Lynn. Now, I did this series at a residency in upstate New York called the Center for Photography at Woodstock. This residency is designed for only artists of color. Now, you might ask me, why is there a residency in the United States for only artists of color? Well, it's because the art world is this big, and black folk in the art world, I can't move my finger that small, but it's like this big, right? And so CPW gives artists of color a voice, an opportunity to have a platform to talk about their work on a larger scale. So during this residency, a man named David Rosenberg came. He was from Slate Magazine. I hadn't even heard of Slate Magazine. He said, you know, India, I really love this project you're doing, the white women with the black hairstyles. You know, what's the name of that? I said, let's call it Can I Touch It? He said, okay, that's good. He interviewed me, and three days before the story went live, he said, you know, India, I think this is going to be kind of big. And I was like, really? And he said, yes. I said, well, here's my personal Facebook link. I mean, that's the only social media I was on at the time. And I said, maybe somebody reach out and talk to me. My life changed in three days. The work was shared on Facebook over 400,000 times. I received messages from women all over the world, India, Africa, Korea, Germany, London, talking about this work, saying, girl, I had an interview and I had to take my braids out the other day. I never saw art that spoke to my personal experiences and had so much humor behind it. For me as an artist, I never realized that my own personal experiences could be universally translated into a way that I'd never imagined as a maker. My own insecurities, my own doubts, my own frustrations at work. And so I realized there was more to be told, this idea of being a black woman in the office. I'd never seen it in the gallery. I'd never seen it in film. That story for me had never been told. And so I knew there was more to be told in that case. Now I'm going to show you the next video. It's called Nine to Five. I may be aging myself a little bit, but does anybody know the movie Nine to Five? I love the film. Okay. It's like Dolly Parton and Jane Fonda, like kidnap their boss. It's amazing. But it's about white women at work. And I asked myself, where is the film about black women at their job? Where is that story? There's Working Girl with Melanie Griffith that came out in like the 90s. Even Alfred Hitchcock has a movie called Marnie that talks about a white woman's experiences. But where is the story about black women's everyday experiences at work, dealing with biases, dealing with discrimination, and dealing with prejudice? I never saw it before, and so I decided to create it. So here is my version of 9 to 5. And I remember one time I was sitting at a board meeting. I came to work, you know, clean, sharp, you know. My stockings was different. It wasn't plain um, stockings to color your legs or or some tight um, taupe. I was wearing, um, um, maybe it might be olive green, black, and and beige stockings together, you know, the colors like that, but it really matched my outfit. And I walked in, and you should have seen their faces. It's like, <gasps> oh my God, you didn't tell me she was black. <laughs> and I was usually the only black. As well as the only female in the room. I thought that was strange in this day and time. Uh, you only have one Af African American uh, in your office. You think I'm a token black? Oh my. Mm, mm, mm. So as we were sitting there and we were talking, one of the men said, African Americans just don't value education. What? 
You are kidding. It blew my mind. And sometimes you're the only black woman at the table. And so when you feel like they're, they're fighting against you, you become mad. And mm -hmm. I wanted to just slam my fist down and said, are you kidding? I was just that frustrated. But of course I said, oh no. Because I know if I became angry, that's one thing that you always have to, to really be mindful of because we are stereotyped African-American women is always being angry. It's an emotion that was struck at me and anger came up, but I had to suppress that. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, I don't know if you've heard this before, but most career or oriented uh, black people, both men and women, have to perform twice and sometimes even three times better than their white counterparts. And throughout my career, I did not allow what people thought about me, whether it was racial, sexual, classism, whatever it was, I did not allow that to determine how I would be, how I would perform, how I felt about me. I, didn't, I wasn't cocky, but I was self-confident. I stood for something that I knew, and I wanted him to know that I didn't agree with it. Mm -hmm. You handled that so well. But I began to see that uh, my opinions weren't so relevant <laughs> anymore. My ideas weren't so relevant anymore. That I was just supposed to follow along with whatever they wanted to do. And you know, and you can mention an idea, but if it's not coming from certain people, you know, it's, it's just totally irrelevant, you know? Now you go figure. Ah, okay, so that's nine to five. So I asked each woman to tell me a story, tell me about an experience where they faced racism or prejudice because they were a woman or because they were black. And interesting enough, each woman had the same story. It didn't matter whether they were in healthcare, banking, education, they were literally finishing each other's sentences. And so putting it together felt easy. It felt organic. Now the next body of work I'm going to show you is Am I What You're Looking For? I used to work at a HBCU. Does anybody know what a HBCU is? Uh, can we say it out loud just for me, you know, somebody? Y'all can do better than that. A little louder. Amazing. North Carolina, where I'm from, we actually have the most HBCUs in the nation. Many people don't know that. So I used to work at Winston-Salem State, which is an HBCU in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. My students were coming to me not to talk about what happened on the yard or to talk about, you know, their classes. They came to talk about their interviews. You see, many of them were seniors, they were graduating, and they were getting their first interviews going into their careers. And they said, you know, Professor Beal, I went to this interview, and someone asked me, how many children do I have and how old are they? I went to this interview and someone asked me, would I be willing to change my hair for the job? I went to this interview and someone said, you know, your name is a little bit, it's a little difficult to pronounce. Do you have like a nickname or something else you can go by so that way, you know, our customers will be able to really be able to pronounce it? And so I realized that my students were going through the same things that my mother went through, that my grandmother went through, that I went through. I'm not talking about something that happened long ago in like 2000, I don't know, early 2000s, 1990, 1980, no, 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 no. This is 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. These things were happening now. And I knew my students wanted the job, like we all do. But what are you willing to sacrifice of yourself, of your culture, of your identity to fit into that space? And so when I'm dealing with troubles and pains, I make work about it. And I asked my students, I said, well, do you want to make some artwork together? Maybe we can work through it and maybe come with a solution in the end. And if not, we can uplift other people who are going through the same things. Now, before I show you this work, I do want to show you a couple of photographers who inspire me. This is a photo talk, right? And so it's important for us to uplift the individuals who kind of paved the way for us. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And it's important for us to know our history, our legacy. So the first photographer we're going to talk about is James Vanderzee. If you don't know his name, please clap. Yes, write it down, right? 
And when you say his name, you can't say James Vanderzee. You have to say James Vanderzee. Like you have to give it the um uh, that it deserves, right? Especially in New York. James Vanderzee was a photographer from the Harlem Renaissance. He was known for making these beautiful portraits in Harlem. When you walked into his studio, baby, you were no longer in Harlem, you were in Paris and you dressed accordingly. When we had blackface and minstrel shows and all these things that made a mockery of the African-American experience, we had James Vanderzee, who was changing the way in which African-Americans were being presented. I think we should say James Vanderzee, because we're in New York, right? Y'all can do better than that. Okay, amazing. So this is Lady with the Wide Brim Hat, created by the James Vanderzee in 1934. The next photographer that I admire is E.J. Belloc. He was discovered by Lee Freelander, who is another photographer. Belloc was photographing prostitutes in the red light district of New Orleans. The thing that I love about Belloc's photographs is that if you zoomed in, she could be the queen of England, but instead Belloc zooms out. He gives us context. He creates a story. He lets us know that we are standing in an alleyway, that she is posing, that this is a performance. And that's the thing that's interesting about Belloc's photographs. Another photographer that I admire is Renika Dykstra. She was known for photographing, she is known for photographing transitions, whether it's a bull rider before he rides the bull and after he rides the bull, an army man before he goes to the army and when he returns. What Renika Dykstra realized is that our personal experiences not only affect us emotionally, they affect us physically. And so she documents that in a photograph. This is her beach series where she, she went to different beaches in Europe and the United States and photographed young people. The thing I love about this particular photograph is that this young woman, she's not a model, she's innocent, and she's transitioning into adulthood or adolescence. And so thinking about what does it mean to become a woman? What does it mean to deal with this awkwardness of being in front of the camera? All those things are documenting the humanity of her. And that's what I love about this one. Now, if we put it all together, you get my work, which is, am I what you're looking for? I went to the home that the women grew up in. I was like, tell your mama we're moving the couch out the way. I'm coming over. I brought a backdrop. The same office where I let the men, you know, touch my hair, right? That same office backdrop, I brought it to their home and stood there and said, listen, I want you to pretend. Pretend you're the only woman, the only black person in this space. How would you feel? We're gonna prepare for the performance. And so each woman wore what they deemed professional. I didn't dictate that. And I allowed them to be in front of that space and to have honest conversations about entering this new space. What does it feel like? This is Kiera and her sister Shakia. They told me that they actually had to change their names on their resumes in order to receive callbacks from employers. And so they talked about the heartache of having to lose themselves in this process of gaining employment. Now there's 15 of these. The New York Times published the first 15, and then Vice Magazine and Huffington Post published the later, so there's 30 in all. And when the story came out, I was scared for the women. I was scared because I knew they were gonna be judged. Judged on their outfits, judged on their hairstyle, judged on their comments. I told them, I said, listen, avoid the comment section. Like, don't look at that. But in many ways, the comment section of both of those publications gave the work life. Am I what you're looking for? Do I really fit your idea of inclusion? Do I really fit that space? Here's Kiara and her sister Kayla. Now, the last body of work I'm going to show you is a video called Mock Interview. I have a little disclaimer before I show you Mock Interview. Now, I was interested in telling more stories about black women at work. And I was focusing mostly on students, young students, black women. And so I said, you know what, I think I want to recruit white men for this series. You know, like I think I wanna work with some white guys. Now, I worked at an HBCU. We didn't have that many white guys over there, right? So I was like, you know what? I'ma call over to Wake Forest University, you know? Like I think they have some white guys over there. So I called over, I'm like, hey, I got any white guys over there? And they were like, actually, we have a lot. And I was like, I know, right? So they allowed me to work with these guys. So I recruited guys, not artists. I wanted like political science majors, economics majors. It was about nine guys who volunteered to be a part of the project. 
I said, listen, I interviewed black women between the ages of 27 and 69, and I asked them to give me one interview question they received over the course of their professional career that they deemed discriminatory in some way. These are the questions you'll be asked. This is called a mock interview. <laughs> you will come, right? You'll wear your professional attire, and I'm gonna interview you. I'm gonna ask you these questions that black women have been asked by white employers. Now, I knew the guys were gonna be a little uncomfortable, so we met before, because there was levels of discomfort in this project. And one guy said, well, what if I say something stupid? And the other guy was like, I think that's the point. I think the point is, <laughs> is that you're probably going to say, you know, something stupid. And I was like, listen, it's going to be okay, right? I'm going to ask you the questions. So this is a mock interview, and I'm excited to hear your guys' thoughts about it afterwards. Why do people have such difficult names to pronounce? I'm sure I'm gonna butcher this one. What's your name? My name's Matt. How old are you? I'm 21 years old. What is your nationality? I'm American. So you're an American citizen? Yes, I am an American citizen. Would you be willing to change your name for the job? I don't know if I'd be willing to change my name. I don't know why that would be necessary. We need to make sure our clients can pronounce your name. So why won't you change it? I take pride in my name. My parents took a long time figuring it out and it's what I've gone by my entire life. So how many children do you have and how old are they? Uh, I don't have any children, so yeah. Hmm. Are you sure you don't have any children? I am sure. When you have children or get married, would you be willing to come into work even if they're sick? I mean, we really want to make sure we can depend on you. I am a dependable person, but if my personal life becomes too much, I would take care of my family first. Interesting. So how do you deal with workplace drama? What do you mean by workplace drama? You know, drama and the workplace. Uh, if there's drama in the workplace, I guess I'd try to talk about it with the people involved, but I try to keep conflict to a minimum. Really? Yes, that's, that's what I try to do. Do you always wear your hair that way? Yeah, I always wear my hair like this. <laughs> Could I buy that hair in the store? Something like my hair. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you could buy it in the store. It's pretty unique to me. <laughs> Would you be willing to change your hair for the job? <laughs> I don't understand why that's relevant. So throughout this interview, you spoke so well. Can you tell me why you were so competent? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just try my best in the workplace, I guess, and uh, hope that people see me as competent. I thought the question about whether uh, I was a parent or not was strange, because I don't understand why anybody would ever ask that during an interview. It just doesn't seem relevant. And um, I don't know, I, I also thought that um, just like the, the education question really threw me off, like you speak so well. And also the question that really threw me was, uh, can I buy your hair in a store? Um, that really dehumanizes somebody to ask that. Like if you can purchase part of their personality, I don't know, it just didn't seem right to me. I can't imagine like getting asked these questions like in a real interview, because especially in the tone <laughs> they're asked, I would just feel so uncomfortable. And if this were a real interview, I definitely wouldn't have gotten the job because <laughs> of how uncomfortable I felt. 
So, yeah, I'm definitely leaving this feeling more empathetic, but also I wonder how to how to change this. Yeah. Um, I think the question that surprised me the most was would I leave my job to take care of my family, which I absolutely would. From the very get-go when you were like, everyone has difficult names and I'm probably going to butcher yours, that kind of like set the tone for how difficult the interview would be. Yeah. It's awful. It's an awful experience. Like in a sense of like the questioning of identity and the pushing of oneself to like conform oneself or also to be on like a... Like I don't feel like it's... A, it doesn't feel like an interview. It felt like a... I was on stand, and it's, it's uncomfortable. Uh, I also laughed because I felt uncomfortable, and I felt, uh, it just felt uncalled for. Yeah. Like, I, 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 to some extent, I knew what I expected, but, yeah. I wasn't fond of it, I'll say that. Or, or like, oh, like, is that your hair or not? Like, who cares? Like, you know what I mean? That's not really, because if this is a job interview, it doesn't, shouldn't have much to do with what you, like how your hair is. It should be that you're, you know, ready to do what you're being asked, like what you're applying for. That's what I would think. Okay, mock interview. So I'm gonna, oh, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So we're going to leave a little time for question and answer, but I'll just end with this. I know there may be some emerging, inspired photographers in the audience. It feels like family, too, a lot of family in the audience. And so I just want to let you guys know that when you think about your vision or where you want to be or where you're thinking about where your work is going to be, I think a lot of times we want to be innovative in those desires. We want to be innovative in our approach. And so I encourage you all to take risk. Even for me as a photographer, if I'm not slightly uncomfortable in the work that I'm making, then I ask myself, why am I making it, right? If I'm not growing as an individual, if I'm not growing as a maker, then what is the purpose of putting those photographs on the wall? And so I encourage you all to take a risk. This work talks about humanity, the work that I show over the past 40 minutes. There were white men, white women, all talking about the experiences of black women at their jobs. I realized that I needed to recruit others to create empathy, to create awareness, that I couldn't do it by myself. And so I encourage you all to continue to take a risk in your own practice, to continue pushing those limits. Thank you so much. Happy birthday, BNH. I love you guys. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Yeah. When you had the photos of the portraits, what camera and lens did you use? And then when you did the video, the short video, what camera and lens did you use? Definitely. So when I did the portraits, um, that was earlier work, and I was using a Canon um, 5D Mark II, so a long time ago. I think a student told me I was in the Stone Ages. <laughs> but, I mean, it came out great. So, again, the tool, as long as it works for me, it works. Um, I'm a Sony artisan. Uh, so that means I'm represented by Sony. And so with the video for mock interview, I was using a Sony camera for that one as well. Yes. And you would ask me that. And I think it was a 35 Prime G Master. Yes. What's up, India? Hey, what's up? <laughs> beautiful, beautiful work as always. Thank um, you. So how do you, it seems like you put a lot of your personal experiences into your work. Yes. How do you juggle, you know, that vulnerability with being creative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question. You know, I realized earlier on in my practice that I had to truly care, right? So I kind of did. This work that I showed you guys over the past 40 minutes, that was 10 years of work. I used to give my students like, assignments for a semester, and they'd be like, a whole semester? I'm like, yeah, a whole semester, right? So 10 years worth of work. And so if I'm going to dedicate that kind of time, I have to love it. Right? It has to feel, I have to feel really personally connected to it. And so all the work that I do, there has to be some type of personal connection for me. Because I dedicate a lot of to the research, um, collaborating with others, and I have to convince them, right, to be uncomfortable with me. And so I also have to be uncomfortable. But I realized in order for me to be uncomfortable, that means I have to expose things about myself that maybe even I have insecurities with. 
right? Because I'm asking someone to come with me, allow me to change your hair, right? And take a picture afterwards, or allow me to put you through a really brutal interview, right? For you to come back on the other side, hopefully with a little bit of empathy and maybe some grace. And so I think for me, I have to have that personal connection because I'm risking something. So I hope that they can risk something with me as well, right? Yes. Hi, um, I'm really inspired by this as an up-and-coming photographer and videographer of color. Um, and I'm wondering, other than the residency that you mentioned, what are other resources um, for women of color, both like to get funding, to create projects, um, stuff like that? Girl, that's a whole seminar. <laughs> So, no, amazing question. I'll, I'll give you a few, and maybe I can send you some, a few we can add it to the site. Um, so I would say even right here in New York, right, there is a studio museum in Harlem that's an amazing residency for artists. Um, CPW, so I told you about that one. Magnum Foundation, um, which is also here based in the city. Um, Open Society Foundation, these are a few that funded my projects. So Open Society funded Mock Interview. Magnum Foundation funded Am I What You're Looking For? They covered all my, tr my travel, my backdrops everything and allowed me to be able to make that work. I'm from North Carolina. Don't sleep on your local state arts councils, grants, residencies. Uh, the North Carolina Arts Council gave me $10,000 to make work. So don't sleep on your, your smaller city and towns. They normally have grants and sometimes those are easier because you're a resident of that space and they know you. Um, and so they'll be able to build a relationship with you. So I got a lot of my local state grants as well that helped me make the work. Um, so those are just a few, but I'll add a little list as well. Like I said, that's a whole class, girl. <laughs> we could do that together, definitely, I'll add that, yes. Good afternoon, Miss Beal. Hey. I wanna thank you for the book. I, I got a copy of your book when you first published it. Thank, thank you, you for the book uh, and the series. Thank you. And thank you for publicly calling out the name of James Vandesey. Oh, you're thank welcome, you. absolutely. My question is this, uh, yes. I am a collector of books by and about black photographers. Yes. Do you have a new book that's coming? Uh, so I'm making new work, and I thought about sharing it here, but I don't have no time, Gabe. So, so uh, hopefully next in the time. next, next time, exactly. <laughs> so hopefully, like I spend a lot of time, I drop, I drop work like, like Kendrick Lamar, right? Like, 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 like my albums don't come out like that, you know? So hopefully in the next five years, I'll be able to uh, make some, a new book, hopefully. Yeah, we'll see, definitely. Any other questions? Hi. Hey. Um, so I have a personal project that I'm interested in doing myself, and I kind of wanted to get your feedback or advice about how do you go about like finding people to participate in it? Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. Uh, in the nine to five video, that first person was my mama, right? The second one was my cousin, and then my auntie, and then my friend, and then my friend's sister. Sometimes you start with family. Right, they believe in you, they hopefully will sit for you, right? And they also believe what you're trying to say. And so those are my first, and I don't use the term subjects, right? Those are, that's my first family that participated. And eventually, if you find one person who's willing, they may know someone, like Desiree knew Charlotte, right? And then Ellen knew Lynn, and so they kind of all had an opportunity to like, oh, I know somebody, right? So I think having just, it starts with one person. And so I started with my family, and then eventually my friends and my colleagues, you know, once they understand the work and understand why you're making it, they're more likely to um, participate. Yes, yes, yes. Hello. Um, great work. This is all so good. Um, a question about the um, first piece that we looked at with the men talking about the experience. What was, did you get their reaction to like seeing it all come together? Because <laughs> I just can't imagine what that would even be like. And how did you navigate that if it was negative at all? Oh yeah, yeah. Like did they run down the hallway when they saw me coming afterwards? I don't know. Um, you know, I explained to them the work before they participated. Right, and they tried their best to enter it. So whether it was through their wife's experiences or their friends' experiences, like they tried, we had a conversation. And I think that's the power of art, right? You'll find that a lot of my work, when I title it, is usually questions, and it's not answers. Like I pose the question, you know, am I what you're looking for, right? Um, you know, can I touch it? That's a whole other question. But the point of the matter is, in posing these questions, it allows people to think about their own biases. 
right, their own relationship with it. And I think those men participating in that work also allowed them to think about their own biases. Um, but we're friends now, right? They follow me on Instagram and stuff, you know? So they've been following the work and supporting it. And so I think for them, it was an opportunity to experience something that was foreign to them, something they never had to think about or consider. And for me, that was the ultimate goal, yeah. Thank you for that, though. Thank you. Um, I noticed in the um, the first piece, nine to five, and in mock interview, your use of like um, static noise, ambient noise, and silence. And I was yes. wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that enhances your work. Yeah. Um, so when I was in grad school, there was a photographer, and I will think of her name before we finish. And she said to me, "When you're doing videos, always have the camera rolling." Even when you're not shooting, just let it roll the whole time, you know? And what happens is when you let the camera roll the whole time, the person who's in front of you is not performing. They're not, they don't know what's happening. So if you let that camera roll the entire time, you're gonna get that static noise. You're gonna get those weird, you know, let me fix my hair and get ready. And that is when they're being their genuine self, right? Because once the camera starts rolling, then people, they're like, oh, let me put my performance on. And you really don't want that as a photographer. You want that genuine human experience. And so I found that keeping my camera rolling the entire time in all of my videos, whether it's my interviews, and sometimes I'll say, hold on, I'll be right back. Right? And I just step out of the room for a little bit, not because I had something to do, but really I just wanted that good shot, you know? And so I would do that intentionally just so I could get that human element because I knew once I came back in the room and they had my presence, it was going to be different, right? So I would say, I would encourage you, especially if you're doing video, always have your camera rolling, even if you're not shooting yet, because you don't know what you can do with that material once you have it. But good question. Yeah, thanks. This one is like... Thank you. Hey, India, it's good hey, to see you. it's good to see you, too. <laughs> this is like a family reunion, y'all, up in here. <laughs> yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Thank yes. you for the beautiful presentation. I always enjoy seeing you speak about your work. It's, it's very inspiring. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. What is your favorite photo book, and what was the last photo book that you purchased? Ah, hard questions, guys, Ooh. hard questions. Okay, let me think. The last photo book I purchased and my favorite photo book Okay, so my favorite photo book is um, Sweet Five Papers of Life, right? Uh, that's like the ultimate photo book. If you don't have it, you've been living under a rock. So I encourage you to get that one. Um, that's Roy de Carava and Langston Hughes. Uh, Roy de Carava did the photographs and Langston Hughes did the poetry baby. And if you're missing out, you're missing out. So I encourage you to get that one. Um, and the last one I purchased, it actually wasn't a photo book. The last book I purchased was actually Deborah Roberts' work. Uh, she came out with her first um, kind of monograph. She does more collage work, it's super amazing. And so if you haven't checked out Deborah Roberts' work, I totally encourage you to see it. Um, it's just really beautiful work, collage work, similar to like Romare Bearden. You can tell I'm an artist talking about artists up here. Um, I would check out her work as well, but thank you for that question, yes. Hi, thank yes. you so much. Your work is so inspiring. I can really see how, I mean, it just inspires me to even look within my own community, the Latinx community, and how important that is. Um, I'm curious to know, when you were seeking funding, was there, a, did you have to push for that, for this project, or were people pretty open about it, the concept? In addition, when you went to go publish, with editors pretty like, oh, okay, this is dope, or was it more like, I don't know. This might be too forward for our time. I highly encourage you to come to the next seminar, which is the perfect pitch. And we're gonna, and actually some of our perfect pitch people are sitting right here. We're gonna talk about pitching your work and how you talk about it so that editors, curators, whomever you're pitching to can actually see your vision, right? Because essentially that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to convince them, you need to give me $100,000 you know, <laughs> to make this vision of mine, right, come true. And so I highly, highly encourage all of you to just stay in your seats for the next talk, the next panel that's happening. You're going to get some gems, some nuggets about how to pitch your work and how to talk about it. Yes. 
Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.